Good morning, respected president of IPS South Zoom, Dr. Ramakrishnan sir, all the senior psychiatrists, uh, dear friends, and the guest of guest speaker of the day, Dr. Narendra Nathan sir. Uh, now we are moving in for the invited lecture for the day. As we are launching the brief course in psychiatric research, we have chosen a topic of utmost importance in research for our invited lecture today. The topic is informed consent in medical research. The speaker is Dr. Narendra Nathane. He is, sir, is a senior consultant gastroenterologist from Thiruvananthapuram. He is an epidemiologist and an avid researcher. He is an excellent teacher and the best person to speak on the topic. The session is to be moderated by Dr. Suresh Badamat, Professor of Psychiatry, Professor and Head of Forensic Psychiatry at Nimhans, Bangalore. You'll also be speaking on research informed consent in the context of impaired judgment. Dr. Suresh Padamat needs no introduction to this audience. He, is, he has procured his MD his psychiatry from Nimhans and also holds a PG diploma in medical law and ethics, PG diploma in human rights and law and a PhD in law from the National Law School of India, Bangalore. He has been the expert consultant or member of various committees and bodies like the National Human Rights Commission. He is the, the member of the Central Committee for Drafting Central Rules for Mental Health Care Act 2017 and the Task Force of mental, for Mental Health Care and Primary Health Care. He has many publications, almost more than 287 publications and has edited more than seven books. He has received the uh, Professor Okaram Distinguished Young Teacher Award in 2014-15 and Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award for Medical Sciences instituted by the government of Karnataka in 2015-16. Over to you, Dr. Suresh Bada. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. And I also would like to present our uh, current today's uh, the guest, uh, the basically Dr. Narendra Nathan, sir. Uh, he has done his MBBS MD from uh, Trivandrum Medical College in 1970 and 74. After that, he did his DM in gastroenterology in 1977 from Wallet Institute of Medical Science and then uh, Masters of Public Health from University of North Carolina. And he had hold many positions as a, as a chairperson of our ethics committee. And also he has been a, he has published so many articles and one of the best I can think of, I was going through his uh, CV, one was in the Lancet. The, it's, it's, he's, he's an amazing person who has been a wonderful researcher and also been a uh, part of various ethics committee and has got gold medal during his uh, MBBS. And also he was a captain of college in cricket team. I, I, I'm also part of the uh, cricket team. So I, I was really relating to Dr. Narendra Nathan, sir. And also uh, his publication goes, uh, least is there. Uh, you can find it even in the Google Scholar. And uh, I don't think we could get a best person than him. So without much delay, I request Dr. Narendra Nathan to uh, give his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Narendra Nathan, sir. Narendra Nathan, sir, uh, we are not able to hear your audio. Please unmute, sir. Please unmute, Dr. Narendra Nathan, sir. Sir, you are muted. Please unmute, sir. Sir, still you are muted, sir. Yeah, right, sir. Now you can speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks to the Research Capacity Building Committee and especially Dr. Indu for giving this opportunity to share this virtual platform 
with some of the shining stars in psychiatry in India. So without much introduction, I go to the topic for research, informed consent in human subject research. Uh, before I go into the thing, let me have a short history recap, recap of the history. Let me take you back to in the early 1940s, the time of the Second World War. The Nazis were ruling Germany and Hitler wanted to create a group of superhumans and now they wanted to create Germans as superhumans. He wanted them to look handsome, to be intelligent and to be strong. And the Germans thought that Yeah, the Germans thought that the beauty lies in the color of the eyes. So they wanted to change the color of the eyes by a number of experiments and the prisoners of war were the victims for this. They injected a number of dyes into their eyes to see whether the color can change and whether they become handsome. They resulted only in destroying the eyes of a number of prisoners of war. They also did a number of cruel experiments. One of the experiments they did was how long can a person survive with just sea water, how long can you survive? Another experiment they did was uh, the time to death experiment. They put a person in the freezer and saw how much time it took for the ECG to stop. And all these were done under the supervision of Joseph Mengele. And Joseph Mengele was also called as the angel of death because of the way he uh, reacted and the way he the, the did cruel experiments on twins. But after the Second World War, all the persons who took part in this research were brought to a trial in Nuremberg. And this is the Nazi doctors and the Nuremberg court. They published the book on human rights and human experimentation in 1947. Perhaps this is the first official document that called for the consent, in, consent of individuals participating in research. It said that the research should be voluntary, they should be protected from harm and that the subjects can withdraw at any time. This was happening in 1947 and some of the persons who are doing this uh, uh, trial were actually Americans. But what was happening in the US it was still more tragic. From 1932 to 1972, about 400 African Americans were denied treatment for syphilis in a place called Tuskegee in the Malcolm country in Alabama. These people were denied treatment for civilians even after penicillin became available in the 1940s. And they were treated for bad blood. And many of these people died. They gave the disease to their spouses. And many of their children also died. And this became one of the startling examples, a powerful symbol of racism in medicine, ethical misconduct in human research, and government abuse of the vulnerable. And then a committee was formed to look into this and they wanted the uh, president to give an apology. Let's just go through that a little bit. The person, this person whom you see here is Herman Shaw, one of the victims of the uh, Tuskegee study and President Clinton addressed the, addressed the audience. Let's see the thing. What was done cannot be undone but we can in the silence. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look at you in the eye and finally say on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful and I am sorry. There were many participants in the Tusky experiment in the audience and some, some people's eyes were welling with tears as President Clinton gave this presidential apology. After all this Nuremberg trial and the Bellman report which came out of the Tuskegee trial, we got a lot of good things for ethics. The, the four principles of bioethics came into were then enumerated. One of the first things is justice. Justice is for everyone give what is his due. You know, suppose you want to do an experiment, let's say on vaccines, and if the vaccine is very, uh, very costly, and uh, some, if some of the villagers in India cannot afford it, then don't do the experiment in, the, in the, those people in India. And if you, can't, if you 
inflict any harm or if you inflict any damage to these people, you should compensate for this. And this is the principle of justice. And then the principle of non maleficence This is what Hippocrates said, primum non nocere, do no harm. Always act in the best interests of the people. And the third is beneficence or always act in the best interest of the people. And then this calls for uh, a competence in medical research. So only competent people can do medical research or if you are doing any procedure, you should be competent to do those things. So beneficence and the next one is uh, respect for persons. And all these are uh, things you can't say one is better for than the other and, uh, and one does not trump the other thing. The respect for person says that you treat a person as an individual, individual who is capable of making decisions. You never enforce your treatment or your research on a person. You first discuss with the person what is what you are going to do and then <coughs> get his consent and to do the research. So respect for persons is the central premise of the concept of informed consent and shared decision making. So this is one of the things. It is informed consent and shared decision making. So informed consent is not just obtaining a subject signature on a consent form. What we do is that we just give a <coughs> paper and ask the person to so sign here. And I think they don't know there are many words in the thing which they may not be even understanding and they just put their signature there. This is not informed consent. <coughs> the, let's go to the one of the different types of consent. One is what is called as an implicit consent. When a person walks into your room, consulting room, it's implied that he is agreeing to be examined by you. An explicit consent is something that is expressed either in words or called verbal explicit consent or written, what is called as a written explicit consent. Verbal explicit consent, if you want to examine, let's say the breast of a lady, you get a verbal explicit consent. If you want to do a PR or a PV, you get a verbal explicit consent. But if you want to do an invasive procedure like an endoscopy, like an angiography, or even do an experiment, get a written explicit consent. The Drug Controller General of India insists that if we are doing a regulatory clinical trial, if we are doing a trial on a new drug, you should get an audio video consent. Audio video consent means that uh, the, uh, the principal investigator, the participant and the impartial witness should be there in the in the audio in the frame when you are taking an audio and video. Now with the introduction with the onset of the coronavirus, the concept our concept the consent methods have also changed. We can get a telephonic consent or you can get an e-consent uh, for a consent through an interactive website. We are I'll go into that a little detail later on, so I'm not going to it in detail now. So what is informed consent? The process by which a person learns about and understands the purpose, benefits, and potential risks of the proposed research. He learns about it and then agrees to participate in the research. And then once the person responsible for the party signs a statement confirming that they understand the risk and benefits of the study, that's informed consent. There are three steps are involved in the informed consent. One, you relate the information. You tell the person that this is what is being done. And second, assure that ensure that the person has got understood the thing. That is ensure comprehension. And third, without coercion or undue influence, make the person sign the, uh, make the person accept the thing and the consent and signs it. So it is consent voluntarily without coercion. You cannot say that uh, the next time when you come, once you enroll in the research, you need not stand in the queue, I will call you. And then these are not the things which you, you should use to influence a person. You can even say that we will give you about 300 rupees per the bystander and for you to come and to this, you will get your free transport. And these are not the things which you want the person to understand. You want the person to understand the procedures involved in the research and then give the consent. These are the steps involved. Relate the information, make the patient understand, and then let him consent without coercion. What are the required elements of consent? First, you should tell the there should be a statement saying that you are suffering from such and such. Or it should be there that 
you are a control, you are a normal person, you are acting as a control in this study. So first, the name of the condition of the disease. And then say that what you are going to do is research. This should be mentioned. This is not treatment. This is research. And then say the purpose of research. I'm trying to find out the effect of this medicine on you. Or the what and see, and see and that should be the purpose of the research. And tell them how much time it takes. You can say that it may take about six months or one year or two years. And then you're telling the procedures to be followed. You tell them that. You will be taking some blood, you will be examining your urine. The bloods are not just to examine your sugar or anything, but to know whether uh, whether it's also for knowing whether there are any side effects due to the drug. So the procedure to be followed and the procedures that are experimental, which are not part of the routine treatment. Once you tell these things, and you should tell them the risks and benefits. You can say that this drug is known to produce <coughs> renal disease in about 2% of the people, <coughs> or some of the things. and then. Uh, the, uh, you can say that the other drugs used in this condition can produce severe drowsiness, but we believe that this will not produce any drowsiness. And then what alternative proceed? If you don't start participate in this, what happens to you? We can say that you can go ahead with the treatment. We will not influence your treatment. If you don't, uh, if you don't take part in this, it's okay. There are alternative procedures are involved. If the research involves some risk, you should tell them that we will compensate, we will pay for the treatment that is involved if their injury is due to the drugs or due to the research. And then we should give the contact information. The principal investigator, you should give the phone number, the phone number of the ethics committee, <coughs> member secretary of the chairman should be there. And the assurance that the participation is voluntary, there is no compulsion, it is just voluntary. And then can withdraw at any time. The person can withdraw at any time. <clears throat> and the third, last is that you will protect the confidentiality of the person. These eight things should be there in the country, in the consent form. You should avoid exculpatory language. What is excul exculpatory language? Exculpate means to clear from alleged fault or guilt. I'll explain it a little further. The consent process may not include exculpatory language through which a subject is made to waive or appear to waive any of his or her legal rights or release or appear to release the investigator, the sponsor, the institution or its agents from liability or negligence. For example, let us go to the next sentence. I waive any possibility of compensation, including any right to sue for injuries that I may receive as a result of participation in this research. No, this word should not be. This sentence should not be there. This is an exculpatory language. In the event that I suffer a research-related injury, my medical expenses will be my responsibility or that of my third-party payer. This is also an exculpatory language. This should not be there in the consent form. So avoid exculpatory language. And how do we go ahead with the informed consent process? The All the things which I've said is in a pension information sheet the form and then there is an informed consent form. Then once the informed consent form is there, you will submit it to the approval to the ethics committee. <coughs> the ethics committee vets, goes through the thing and then approves it or suggests modifications. And then what you do is that you administer the consent form <coughs> to the subject and then get the person's signature. Suppose the person is not literate or there is any else they are deaf mute or cannot understand or young, what you do is that you get the signature from legally authorized representative or called LAR. The legally authorized representative will be someone who is uh, related to this person and then a legally responsible for that person. It may so happen that the legally responsible person for that individual is also illiterate. Then what you do is that you explain to them and then get a uh, uh, get an uh, impartial witness to say sign. So this is the uh, informed consent process. You submit it to the ethics committee, ethics committee approves it, you administer the form and the person signs it. If the person is illiterate or cannot sign, you get a legally authorized representative. If the representative is illiterate, you get an impartial witness. And then it should be dated. The date should be there in the informed consent form. It's 
person shape. Another thing that is is that it is better that you have different color for the different consent form. Suppose you have the first consent form submitted to the ethics committee and approved, you can have it in white color. Then after some time you modify it because you think that certain things you want to include uh, persons uh, with hypertension may also be included. You find that some things have changed. So you come up with the second version of the informed consent form, make it a second and uh, a different color. Making the different versions in different colors is important because when the, when it is subjected to an audit, they do not go through every consent form in detail. Once they know that there is the pink colored form, which is the version two is there, they know that that has been used in this person. So it's better that you have a different colored forms for different versions of the informed consent process. And what is e-consent? E-consent is that you digitally engage the patient by the tablet, iPad, mobile, desktop or computer, and if the person is able to access that, and then you submit this and give an ICF tired consent. Tired consent is that, you, are you below the age of 50? Yes, then you can participate. Are you that pregnant? They say yes, then don't participate. So many questions will be there and then give it to this, and then explain the procedure in pictures and games or videos. The person understands it and then puts his <coughs> electronic signature or you can even check a box in a website and then you see whether the person has understood it. <laughs> you see how much time do you think this procedure will take, this research will take. You can give different options and if the person has understood it, he will know correct, correctly inform the thing. So this is e-consent and this is going to be the consent in the future. Because a study done in 2013 in California found that the, the Comprehension is superior with e-consent. 75% of the people understood it much better uh, well what was the consent form is about. But a 58 person, only 58 person could understand what was written in an e-paper. And now signing the informed, what does it mean that if you sign a consent form? You have received all the information about the study. This is one of the things. You understand the information and you have had a chance to ask questions. You use this information to decide if you want to participate in the study. <clears throat> if you agree to participate in the study, you give your consent by signing a consent form. <clears throat> the completed document is a legal document. The completed signed form is a legal document that gives that lets the investigator go ahead with the study. The waiver of consent, you can waive the consent in certain situations. Retrospective studies, you are doing a study on patients and you don't know which the, and you have de-identified the person, so no <coughs> identifiable information is there. Or on, uh, if you are doing a study on labs, specimens in the lab, uh, and without any linking information, you need not require any consent. Public health studies, now suppose I want to study whether the usage of mass, how much has it influenced the prevention of COVID? I study the, how people use masks in different districts in Kerala, and see whether, uh, let's say that, uh, whether the use of mass, proper use of mass and the COVID uh, rates have any association. So these types of programs need not require an informed consent. Research on data available in public domain. You know that the, uh, many things are available in public domain because the population, the human development index, a number of things are available. And if you're doing a research on that, you need not do a, a consent. Research during humanitarian emergencies and disasters when the person may not be in a position to give consent. The question is whether you should do a research at all at that time. We'll come to it a little later. And I think and you should attempt should make to participate, you have obtained the participants' consent at the earliest. Life-threatening situation necessitating the use of the test article. Inability to communicate or obtain legally effective consent. This is not, that time is not sufficient to obtain consent from subject legal representative. I'll tell you an inc incident which occurred recently. There was a study of remdesivir in COVID. A remdesivir or combat with placebo in the treatment of COVID. And a lot of people were studied and they find that a person, that some persons are deteriorating in spite of treatment. And then they go ahead and open the um, uh, blinded, uh, Thing and they find that this person is on placebo. 
and they decide that because the person is deteriorating from the placebo, they want to give this person the test drug. And I think, you know, so this may happen at any point in time, and they may be happening at night in the ward, the person is deteriorating, and you want to give the test drug instead of the placebo, you may not be able to get the time consent. You can waive the consent, waive the consent, and then give the drug to that person. No available alternative method or approved generally recognized therapy. This would apply to the situation that I told you now. But in this situation, you know, this should be evaluated by a physician who is not in the investigation team and okay, as in what you have done is okay. You should say that thing. And then this should be submitted to the institutional review board within five working days and get their consent. These are the various ways where you can get waiver of consent. These are many consents where informed consent will be difficult, like impaired decisional capacity, intoxication, pain, anxiety, illiteracy, and lack. And these are the barriers to adequate informed consent. How do you, this I think someone is discussing, so I'm not going into the details of this one. One thing which I'd like to say is that there are studies which have showed that the persons who are, who are mentally ill persons who participate in a trial were compared to the persons who are in a trial which was not involving mentally ill persons. This study found that, there are studies which found that the capacity to understand is same in the two groups. There's also studies which show that the, the persons in the mentally ill group were not able to comprehend as much as the others. But there is a very interesting study which showed that the reduced capacity to uh, consent can be overcome by an educational intervention. So if you think that there is a reduced capacity, then you can give an educational intervention. This is a very good article mentioning about this and then do the study. There you can get a proxy consent or a consent from a legally authorized representative. Well, let's go to the case study one. This is something which really happened. Sexual behavior in urology patients. You know, the urology professor asked the PG to do a study of sexual behavior in in some type of urology condition. This really happened, you know. This was study was done in Kerala and the postgraduate student is in Maharashtra, but he doesn't know the local language. He searched the literature and gets out some questionnaire which are used to study sexual behavior in English. So what does he do? He types these questions in an English to Malayalam translation website and translates the whole document. And he takes and he puts this as the informed consent form and submit it to the ethics committee. And the professor of urology does not even read through the, does not read through these things. You no, know? but I think that because you think that he is a postgraduate student and he is responsible, you may overlook this. Please, please understand that sexual behavior questions, the way you, the difference between vulgarity and civility may be very narrow. And if you just Google it and find out the translation, you may be way wrong. I had a chance to go through this. It was just filled to the highest order. And I think that please, please look at this into this matter and don't allow people to undergo such, do such questions. So what do you do when you want to administer something in a different language? You should do what is called, trans, not translation, actually transcreation. To translate not only the language, but what comes out in the culture, what is there in the emotion. These things should be tra translated. So. And you, let's say there is a consent form. You translate it in English. You translate it to Malayalam. Malayalam is the language in Kerala, you all know. And then you ask two people to translate it into the language. And after this, these two people sit together and and reconcile and arrive at a final kind of final translation. This is back translated to the original English. And this back translation should be done by a person who has not uh, read this thing. And this should go on and forth a few times and finally you come up with a consent form which is exactly like this in culture, in concept and in language. You finally review and then come out with the final document. This I have told you, know, you have to go back and forth. And this is how you come out with a, a translation in a different language and this we call as linguistic validation. And I think these are important things. Don't take this lightly. And we have got many questionnaires which are available in English and which we translate to our native language. And please follow this linguistic validation. <clears throat> this is the second 
And I think many psychiatrists may know about this. Prasanjit Kodar is a person from Bengal. He went to study his graduate studies to California and there he met a Russian uh, a lady with Russian descent called Tatiana Tarasov. They were friends, I think. They were just friends only. And um, they were going together. And uh, Tatiana had actually had a steady boyfriend, was different. Then Tatiana once told Prasenjit Koda, uh, the new year is coming. Why don't we go to the town hall and ring in the new year? Prasenjit said, OK, we'll go ahead and do the thing. Both of them went to the town hall. The clock struck 12. Tatiana kissed Prasenjit and said, Happy New Year. Prasenjit was excited. He thought that Tatiana was in love. He knelt before her and said, Will you marry me? She said, No, no, no. I have got steady boyfriend. I know I can't. Prasenjit became very angry and he ran away. I will kill you, he said. He went back to his room and he didn't go to the college. And he was behaving very unusually when he was brought to the psychiatrist. The psychiatric resident who saw the thing thought that this fellow is dangerous to Tatiana, so he informed the police. And then the police informed, looked into it, and then let him away. But the boss, when he came, was very angry. You don't know about confidentiality. Who asked you to tell the po police? And never do this, never repeat this, he said. And after about uh, two weeks, Prasenjit ran to Tatiana's house and dragged her out. And she was running and he stabbed her eight times. And the Tatiana's blood-filled body was lying there on the lawns of her house. And she died in that thing. So this is something which really happened. And then uh, when you talk about confidentiality, this disclosure of confidential information is essential to avoid danger to the others. But understand that the pro protective privilege ends where public peril begins. So after this, an addition to the informed consent form has been made. Any information that is obtained during this study will be kept confidential to the full extent permitted by law. However, it is possible that in the event of legal action, the researcher may be required to divulge information obtained in the course of the research to a court of or a legal body. You may know that many psychiatrists, I'm sure, will know about Terrace of duty, you know, this is called as based on from our name Terrace of duty. If you think that a person is dangerous to one thing, you should take steps. You know, during your psychiatric examination, you found out that the person is please divert that you know, please take necessary step that the victim is not um, is not harmed. But there is also the other side to this. A psychiatry professor, a psychiatry professor was examining a person and he understood that this fellow was very anti-social and then he informed it to the employer of this uh, uh, psychiatrist, this patient and then but the court found that what the psychiatrist did was wrong but uh, then there are many uh, the pros and cons of this but i think please understand that if a person is a threat to uh, threat to life always take steps you should have taken or at least in the book there should be steps that you have taken to avoid this danger let's go to the another case study. This is a case study where the father has given, I'm studying, let's say, putting a tube into the nose of this patient, taking the gastric juice and studying the gastric juice of this patient. This patient has not reached the consent age, but the father has given me consent. The child is coming to me and is crying and he doesn't want to allow me to do the study. Can you do the study in this person? The father has given the consent. Should I? Can I do the study? No, you cannot. The child should do a, give assent. Parents must give consent for, for their children to participate, but the children, especially above the age of six, must assent to participate. Assent is an affirmation, affirmative action on the part of the child, indicating the willingness to participate. A child is a person who has not attained the legal age of consent. Above the age of six, up to 18, it is better that you get, you make them sign an assent form so that that you know that you are not violating them. They are children, but don't go against them. Get an assent from the child, but a consent from the legally authorized representative. The other case study about the informed consent is about a professor of medicine wants to study the effect of egg yolks on the serum cholesterol. He plans to give two egg omelets every day to the study subjects and study the serum cholesterol every week. 
he wants to study the thing so but his student is the plan is to take postgraduate students as the study subjects when the so when the study subjects come everyone is getting two omelets every day and then their blood is examined is there any ethical dilemma in this is there any ethical dilemma in taking your own students as study subjects you know this is something which we are which we may do but always understand that a student is a vulnerable subject this vulnerable subjects are susceptible to exploitation there is unequal power relations and there is a dependency for if you want to get through your exam people may think that please participate in the research of your boss erosion of voluntariness there is the erosion of the voluntariness component of consent the person may be giving consent but it may not be voluntary so there is an erosion so vulnerable subjects we as far as possible don't include them the required additional they require additional consideration or protection vulnerable subjects are pregnant women human fetuses and neonates prisoners students and employees children minorities completely impaired persons and other persons are the vulnerable subjects what is reconsent <coughs> or the fresh consent there are situations for example when a new information becomes available or when a person was unconscious you started the study and he becomes conscious you should get his consent and if it is a long term study and the child becomes an adult you should get his consent if there is a change in the modality you should get a reconsent if there is a possibility of disclosure of identity you should also get a reconsent we did a study on mao you know there there is a rain factory in mao where there was a pollution from this factory and we wanted to go to the community and see whether they have got any lung diseases we compared it with the population which was not exposed to this in this situations we get what is called as a community consent when you are exposing at the so this is a community consent and i think this is about dora and freud i talked to one of your professors dr anil prabhakar and said can i discuss about dora and freud to this meeting is that you will be carrying coal to newcastle but if you want to and drive home some point go ahead and present the thing you know about the dora and freud freud uh, actually concealed their name and to dora but everyone it soon happened that everyone knew who dora was you know about the dream that dora had i, I know that i may, all of you may know about the dream the dora dreamt one day that there was a fire broke out in his house his father, her father came rushing to her and was vacate vacate she said but her mother said no let us wait i want to take all the ornaments also along with you he said no 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 no, no we are more interested in the welfare of my children they are the people uh, so he ran away with the two daughters that he had and uh, dora says that when she was went out of the room she became conscious what is direct here is that the thing that he wanted to take the valuable things he wanted to take was actually <clears throat> the it was actually related to virginity but his father was not actually so much bothered about her virginity that's what dora said but later on it happened that this lady dora who participated in this research was ida bowe and her uh, brother was a famous uh, communist party leader in austria so i think whatever there uh, there is a good chance that the identity of a person in a case study will be revealed and nowadays people do read the medical literature they browse the net and many a time there are many issues of cases against doctors who are reported case reports so now there is a um, statement that we should have an informed consent for case reports about a new international standard of editorial policy calls for written informed consent by the study subjects of every case report the uh, study the journals which took part there were 14 or 15 journals took part one of the journal of american medical association the lancet bmj uh, new england journal of medicine the uh, new zealand medical journal the uh, the canadian medical journal these journals are part of it but one of the surprising things which two others pointed out stephen levine and students susan stagno pointed out was that there are no psychiatrists in this group so within the family of medicine is psychiatry a red herd at step child 
Now, I thought about this when one of the earlier speakers were saying that in the NMC, psychiatrist was not a properly represented. Is it uh, is psychiatry a red-headed stepchild? Why there are no psychiatrists? It is a psychiatrist to face this uh, damn uh, this problem of getting an ethical consent when they are reporting case reports. It's ethically appealing, but you know that when you describe the sexual behavior of a person, their sexual affiliations, you are uh, betraying a person. How can you tell a person that I'm going to do all these things and ask him to read the thing and sign it? And then you may come out with the person's what he feels in his mind and all when you when a psychiatrist puts him to black and white, can he do it? But I think this is the law. And now he wanted to publish in a good journal a case report, get an informed consent from the person. Concerns regarding the news policy for mental health publication based on issues of transference, counter-transference, best interest of the patient, and practicality are all our issues. But I think that now, if you want to publish in a decent journal, you should get you should show this to an informed to this patient who is part of the thing and get his consent. There is an advantage of doing this thing. <laughs> Sorry? Any pro sorry, anything? Nothing, sir. Nothing, sir. Nothing, sir. Please continue. Nothing, sir. Any procedure without consent would have amount to battery. Any procedure that you do in a person without consent would amount to battery and assault. You may feel that after uh, informed consent, you are safe. But please understand that I'm Sign consent form of any nature neither guarantees protection against legal action nor ensures patient satisfaction. It merely demonstrates that some process to exchange information was followed. Informed consent is probably the most revolutionary, the most rudimentary, and the most misunderstood and misused term in all health law and bioethics. Thank you. If you've got any comments, please, I would be happy to hear your feedback. This is my email. DrNarendran at gmail.com and thanks for the patient hearing. Thanks you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think we will take the questions in the end because uh, there are a couple of uh, things which the questions may come. I'll be presenting. So I'll just take around hardly 10 to 15 minutes uh, the presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So <clears throat> just a minute, I'll be sharing my screen. <clears throat> 